Pete Calandra here. Welcome to episode 13 of Inside Track. This is my weekly music education video where I pick a topic and spend between an hour and 90 minutes discussing it. On this week's video, we'll be taking a look at the score I created for a recently released docu-series on NBC's Peacock streaming service titled The 96 Effect. I'm going to read from the press release. The first generation of American girls born under Title IX entered the 96 Atlanta Games with high expectations, low media interest, and little financial support. Yet they shocked the world with one golden victory after another. The 96 Effect shines a light on the women who changed the lives of generations of girls who, because of them, are now free to play. The three episodes come in at about 100 minutes in total length, and there's about 90 minutes worth of music over the course of the three episodes. Typically what happens when I work on a project is that I'll have discussions with the filmmakers and maybe I'll write some music to give them an idea as to the direction of the score and see if they like that. Once that's done, I start getting film to write to. In this particular project, there really wasn't going to be time to post score it because the turnaround time from the end of the film until it was released was literally 10 or 12 days. And so I started writing music about three weeks before they started editing. Working like this created a completely different set of issues than actually scoring to picture. In some ways, it made my life a little bit easier, but in other ways, it was more difficult. So things were easier in that I could write stuff straight through without having to write unusual time signatures to make things fit in and line up with different video cuts and all that stuff. I could just write pure music straight through. But the other side is that this music had to tell a story. There had to be themes that reprised and were varied straight out. There had to be multiple themes to fit multiple kinds of moods and emotions. And I had to imagine the kinds of stories they were going to be telling and how they were going to be telling it and construct the music for that. It was a great challenge and one that I'm very happy with the results of. Now, this is going to be a two-part series, and today's the first part, and then next week I'll release the second part. There'll be timestamps in the description box below so that you can navigate between the different sections. Also, if you've got any comments or questions, I'd love to hear them, so please leave them down below. Thank you so much for watching, and let's get right into it. This is a look at the first well, the se first cue we're going to go over, which was the second actual cue I wrote for the project. And when you're not scoring to picture, when you're just writing pieces in the abstract that are going to be cut to, you have to have enough control over your composing style, and you have to also understand how visuals in the style that you're working in are cut, right? So... I have worked with this production company on a bunch of projects, so I'm aware of how they work with documentaries, some of the things they do, some of the things they like, and I also am aware of how they like to build a story. So when I'm writing these cues, I'm trying to build all those things in. Also, where would this fit? What kind of activity would happen for this cue to fit in? So these are the kinds of things that you should be aware of before you start writing, and then you simply construct the piece of music to fit those parameters. And, you know, you give a certain amount of time for one bit, you do a transition to another bit, which is a different feel, a different mood, a different part of the story. And I'll go over all that stuff as I'm talking about these cues. But right now for this first one, let's first start with how I've set up my Pro Tools. Basically, this is a template that was used for every cue in the score. And I may have added a few instruments here and there, which was very easy to do just by duplicating tracks. It gives you your group routings and your output routings and all that stuff. And then just putting in the new patch. This was the template for the entire score. Starting from the top, you notice I've got all these purple tracks. And these are what I called high pulsers. And they've got, they're all grouped together. They're all colored. And they're basically instruments that are higher pitched, and maybe they're bell-like, typically doing pulsing things, melodic things. It's just a name. It's a generic name I gave, Just and I, I understand what it does. I'm using patches from Spectrosonics, Spitfire Audio, Heaviosity, Cinesamples, Easy Drummer, Arturia, Scarby. Those are a vast majority of where I got my sounds from. And I'm just going to quickly play through some of these sounds. I did play real guitar on some of the tracks, but I like the nylon string here. And this is a Zimbira, which is a thumb piano. 
with some sound design to it. And then this is Spitfire Mandolin Swarm. And I like that sound because it's a little magical to my ears. Some Celeste Balls, also from Omnisphere. And that sounds really cool when you double it with the Mandolin Swarm. You have to balance the volume a little bit, but you get the idea. Then Joby Burgess Glock. And also the Tube. These are Spitfire. Finger cymbals are from Cinesamples. And then the suspended cymbals from the Spitfire. And got do all my mallet rolls. And then Hans Zimmer percussion. I've got just a menu with different sounds going up the keyboard. And that becomes very versatile. This is Heaviosity ethnic drums, ensembles. Joby Burgess Timp. And here I've done a little EQ, right? I've just added a little bit around 2K for the snap and I've done a high pass filter just to get rid of some of the low rumble. I don't really need that from it. I just need the, I need it to be punchy and, and big sounding and I don't need it to conflict with any other low end I've got. So I put a high pass filter on that. Next, I've got some tracks of the Bonham drums from Hans Zimmer. So this Right, so the first one I use for the hi-hat, then this one I'm using for fills, and this one I'm using for the kick drum, and oh no, the kick drum is from Easy Drummer. Cross stick is from Easy Drummer. I just like the sound of that better for this. And then I've got some drum loops below that. Uh, I have four set up, but I only used one in this one. And this is from Stylus, and Stylus is a very mature uh, piece of software right now, and you can for sure just call up your loops and use them as they come out of the box, but as is typical for Spectrosonics, there is quite a bit of deep programming available to sound design and completely transform the factory presets. And I think that you should do that. You should learn how to do that. I could do a whole tutorial on Stylus and how versatile it is and how you can really just totally transform any sounds that go in it. But what I did with this was I used these brush kungas and I went to the time designer I changed the meter, did a different variation, variation C, and I did time shift, right? So I moved everything back an eighth note. And then I played around with the feel, right? The, I added a little swing and I simplified it a little bit. It's almost like having a different player at the session. So that's really cool. And then down below that, I have the mini Moog bass, which I'm not using on this track. I am using on others, and that's from the Artoria Mini 5. And then below that, it's the Scarby Rickenbacker bass, which I used on many cues because it's got a really good edge and then especially if you add some distortion to it with sound toys plugins it really it really works well and then i'm using the keyscape c7 i love the sound of yamaha pianos i've got a, a beautiful yamaha s7x piano uh, acoustic piano making it a little brighter so it'll cut through the mix and taking off some of the low end so it won't get muddy. Then this is the Scarby Rhodes, and I've done a little bit of thinning out in the mid and again, cutting out some of the lows. If you're gonna be a modern 21st century composer, you need to learn how to sculpt and shape your sounds, right? That's really important. And then I've got two Wurlitzer patches, and let me just show you how I combine these to create an aggregate sound. So this is the Artoria Wurlitzer, and if you're listening with headphones now, that's coming out of the left ear, and it's a little thin. Uh, well, I programmed it that way. I put it through this little cassette plugin to make it a little bit lo-fi. And this is, I believe, a free plugin from this company. It, it's handy. It's really cool. It's not the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it's pretty cool. And then I added some Crush from Devil Lock, which is Sound Toys. So that's that one. And then this one here is the Scarby, I believe, or is it the Keyscape? Yeah, it's the Keyscape 140B, which is an old school Wurlitzer as opposed to the 206 with the plastic case. And I scooped out a little mids, added a little high end, and added a little crush there. So this one's a little bit mellower. And then when you play them together, I've got them panned, so I've got a nice stereo panning. So that's a cool little tip. And then there's some Celeste, which isn't on this track, but this is from the Spitfire and the Spitfire harp. And then on this particular track, I'm only using Iceni brass. On some of the other tracks, there's more brass. I just duplicated the Iceni brass track 
a bunch of times and renamed it and put in a different patch. They were all grouped to the brass VCA. They were all grouped to the right output. Let me just activate these VCAs. They're not active. And then there's uh, some Omnisphere synth pads. And on this one, I'm using this ag Agape Warmth. And I'll show you how that works later on. And then I'm using some vocal phrases from Heaviosity. I've got Vocalese 2 on two different tracks. Probably doing some panning with that. Is that correct? Yes, some MIDI panning over here. And then below that, there's the Omnisphere. And this is a vocal pad. And I'm going to play this, and it's not going to sound like a vocal pad. Right, and that's because I've got that, first of all, little EQ, and I've got that going through my friend, the Gatekeeper. If I were to turn this off, right, add this back in. So that's a, a sort of great way to create some rhythmic activity with just holding out, as you can see, footballs here. I also use the uh, high pass filter. Well, I did this here, but I've also got a, here we go, I did it here. I knew I did a high pass, a low pass filter. And so then I've got a bunch of different strings below that. For this particular bit, I used almost all sections with these solo violin and the solo cello. So for on this particular patch, I just used the legato cello and then the ice high strings. This is from uh, Art, uh, Albion Tundra. Some string, Spitfire string evos, and I'm not sure if this is just from the string evo, orchestral string evos, or if it's from the uh, Olafur Arnold's, I forget which one. Uh, I guess we could look. Yeah, just from symphonic string evolutions. And then we've got some change, strings ricochet, that's from Albion Tundra. Then some chamber strings, which is the Spitfire chamber strings. And then the only other thing is the Abbey Road High strings and the spiccato. And then low strings, Abbey Road, also Spitfire. And then there's two track, four tracks of acoustic guitar right here. And this one's not correctly named. Oops, this should be Guitar 4. I would fail myself. <laughs> Just kidding. And here are all the tracks where all those groups of instruments get routed to, and these are audio tracks, and I've got them input enabled so that I can hear the MIDI information being played and routed through here. And then when it becomes time to make stems like I've got here, I will uh, simply record enable, start, and then you notice that all my stems are the same length long, so that's really good. And I do some additional mixing. You can see I've done a little volume work on some of these. I've got some plugins on some of these to do some more sound design to them. They're routed to the, all their uh, time-based effects, which are down here. I've got lots of reverbs for each different group. And then my main music output, which I have, these are all inactive. Let me make these active so we can listen to them. So this is just an AUGS track that everything's routed to. And then I've got my master. And on my master, I've got my Clarity M, which is my desktop meter, and I can see the overall EQ of the entire track. I can see the loudness. I can see the phase cor correlation. I can see, uh, you know, left and right, which one is how the balance is volume-wise. And so that's just always on on my desktop, and it's really a great tool. Let's take a quick listen now that we've done a few minutes on the template.
All right. What am I trying to capture with this piece? This is a story where people are going to be talking into a camera and they're going to be remembering their take on what went on 25 years ago. So there's going to be people talking, they're being interviewed, asked questions, and giving their side of the story that's interspersed with footage from the time, archival footage. The way I've built up this cue would be that somebody's talking and then you're cut to game action. And they're talking about maybe the build up to a game, there's competition, maybe there's some some point they want to prove, or maybe they're nervous about like how good are they and how they'll do on the international stage. And then there's the competition and then there's the aftermath. And with this particular piece, I thought the aftermath would be more reflective in, in terms of maybe somebody got injured and how would they deal with that going forward? Or maybe they didn't perform as well as they thought they should or any kind of reflective thing afterwards. Let's talk about how I constructed that. So I've got this pulse with the percussion here. Right, so you got that hi-hat, one, two, three, right? And then da-da-da-da-da. Zimmer percussion and then a foot hi-hat. Right, that's, that's somebody using the hi-hat with their foot on the pedal as opposed to hitting it with the stick on the bell or on, on the edge of the hi-hat. Against that, I've got this female vox pad. So there's that rhythmic bit. And then with that, I've got the ricochet strings. So let's just solo those ricochet strings. Ricochet. All right, just add an air of mystery. So that's pretty cool, right? So we're just, you know, something's gonna be happening. And then I wanna build it up. So I've got this figure here. Did it, dick, did it. Da, 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 and that's in the Wurlitzers. And then I've got a drum loop. That's that uh, brushed kungas that I sound designed. Right, and this is just building up. Building, building. More anticipation. You're getting close. And then... What's going to come up next is a descending string run. One of the things that you see in a lot of documentaries to give some action, because a lot of it is, again, people talking, is that they do quick cuts of a bunch of still photographs. Boom, 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 boom. And so having figures like this next one gives the opportunity for the filmmakers to do that. So let's play that. And then this is one of the main themes for the fi entire film. I've got a bunch of variations on this that I did. But this is, you know, competition. There's games going on. And I play that in the piano. Let's see if I can get some sheet music up here. Yeah, here we go. So it's just a simple four chord progression, right? E minor, G major, C major to A suspended, right? And then to A7 or just A. What I really like with this is I've got the piano. And then just a little bit of harmonic support with the roads. At this point, I also start playing acoustic guitar, and I do a really just a driving rhythm here. And the way I recorded the guitar. I didn't mic it up. I have a Fishman pickup that looks like a guitar pickup that goes across the sound hall, and I just plugged that directly into my audio interface. And the reason I did that is I wanted to get a really sharp percussive sound, and that kind of DI sound with an acoustic guitar does that. It's not like the sensitive, soft stuff that you would really want to have a microphone for. So that really worked out well, and it was very quick and easy for me to record.
And then now I've got those accents leading to the downbeat with the low brass and some timpani hits. This time through, I guess this is the fourth time through the progression, I start bringing some vocal phrases in here along with some high string lines. And again, see, do do deep, but do do boop, but do do boop, but do more opportunity for picture cuts and transitioning into another section, right? So that will help the filmmakers out for this kind of documentary bit. And this gets a little bit more reflective here. So this is the aftermath after the competition. So I changed the guitar figure there. Again, I'm still using the direct input. I probably should use the microphone here. Say la vie. It still sounds fine for this because it's not exposed. And let's talk about how I created this uh, melodic line here in the low strings. So I've got this, just the, the bass line in the chamber strings and there's a solo cello. And then a little bit of a melodic figure. And then I double that with this synth sound here on the green track. Here we go. And that just adds sort of a sheen towards the end of the long notes. And then a long string evo. Transition us into this little melodic figure here. And what I do here that's kind of cool is I've got the mandolin swarm and the celeste bells doubling the piano, create an aggregate sound, right? So that's part of orchestration. And then I end it the way it begins with the pulsing vox pad. And the ending is, it's an ending, but it's not a finite ending in terms of it doesn't feel like this is the end of the film. That's a look at this particular one. We'll move on to the next one. On this next track, we've got a little bit of a different kind of music. I would call this more sort of storytelling music. Maybe they're talking about childhood or something that happened that was a little bit sweet or reflective. There's just a, a few ways that you could think about this. If we look again here at the score, we notice that I've got the same kind of template. I'm not changing anything yet, and I've got my stem mixes. And before we get into this, I'd like to talk about a way that I extended the amount of music I gave them. And if we look here, I've got two additional mixes that I made of this track that I gave to them so that they would be able to possibly use the same piece of music multiple times and it doesn't sound exactly the same. There's multiple ways of doing that, but the way that I did that this time was that I just basically copied the entire track and then pasted it here and then pasted it again and then did some muting here in the stem area. I could have just copied this and pasted it over here. Made some things a little bit shorter with different endings so that it can be used in multiple places because the second half of this is very different and maybe you don't want to have that second half but you want to have something that has a nice ending for the first half of the piece. That's one thing that I sort of did with all of this. If I did 33 pieces of music for the film, it actually ended up being close to 120 mixes. So let's take a listen to this and then we'll break down the track. And again, we're monitoring through the MIDI tracks, not the mix.
just repeats on that vamp and ends on a chord. Now, this was taken directly from the demo suite I did and just reworked. I played everything back in and just reworked this to make this into a separate longer piece instead of just a small section of the demo suite. We start off with this nylon guitar. Right, just a very simple do da beam bo da bum very simple figure and there's some very light drum brushes on the cymbals and there's that nice finger cymbal and i have a, an acoustic bass this time not on the downbeat one two three four one two three one two one right so i'm sort of having that in not on the downbeat and that's something that i like to do often with my bass parts in pieces of music like this is sort of disguise that downbeat now if we move a little bit further starting right here at measure five i've got this celeste part right here so if i would have just solo that right and we'll see how that fits in with the nylon string guitar Right, so it's like the celeste f f completes the figure that started in the nylon string guitar. And then if we add the acoustic bass. Right, so see how that's not on the downbeat, it's kind of cool. So over here, our figure starts in the middle of the bar and ends in the downbeat. So it's, it, and it creates a little cross rhythm of two against three, because if you notice this, this is two dotted eighth notes, and there's three eighth notes right here in the same time. So I've got a little polyrhythm going on there. I do it in a way that's subtle and is in keeping with this kind of feel. And I've got a, a melody in Lydian, right? So if we look at the mandolin swarm, which is right here, we're in key of G. You can see there's all sorts of G's around here. I've got that C sharp, which gives us the Lydian feel. Now notice how I switch that, I'm in the key of A, so I do an unprepared key change. It's just a, I just moving the mode up a whole step to A Lydian. And you notice I've got the A and the D sharp. This is an enharmonically incorrect spelling, but it's Pro Tools, yeah. I switch that so it's, you know, I pass the P's sort of between this first time that the melody comes in and the next time. And I change the orchestration around a little bit. So let's go to the piano roll editor. Another thing that's kind of cool is if we have our Mando Swarm and we've got our Rhodes, right? I'm playing the same thing on both of those. And I'm using the sustain pedal on the Rhodes to give it a little bit of a dreamy sound. You get the wash. So that's, again, when you're making these combinations of instruments, you can really come up with some beautiful textures. And then there's that little little vo vocal thing from again from Heaviosity. And then now let's see we've got uh, solo violin and cello legato here. So. What happens is that I pass the figure around right between the celeste and, and the violin in octaves that the uh, electric piano and the mandolin swarm were playing in the previous iteration. But that's not the melody anymore. The melody is in the cello with that ascending figure. Right, and what's cool, what I like about that is that um, I've sort of taken that cello, let's solo that here.
And to that, I changed the accompaniment. So we've got the Rhodes and the Wurlitzer. So I was playing those ascending triads, right? A, B, C sharp minor. So it's A major, B major, C sharp minor, and then that looks to be a diminished triad. But it's really just an A chord to a B, ma to a B chord, to an A, a major seventh chord, because the bass note has the A, and then it's just passing tr you know, six, four, or second inversion triads up and down. And that just sort of changes the texture and the feel so that I'm not playing the same thing over and over again. And there's sort of a counterpoint there. In the harp. Jump up the octave there with the celeste and the violin. Yeah, let's get rid of this notation stuff. All right, so before. Okay, great. And then now we move up again to C major, and we've got the melody in the piano. Again, a different melody. Doubled with the Rhodes. And we've got harp. All right, so that creates sort of like a combination sound, right? All those three together doing that, like a little ensemble. And then those, the passing chords get passed off to this choir pad. Let's see, I think it's this one here. And notice this time through, that choir pad does not have the gatekeeper on it, and it's much more breathy and airy because I don't have the low-pass filter on it. And then let's see what the chamber strings are doing. So constantly lifting, right? Constantly ascending, going up, moving forward. Everything is rising, and that gives you sort of a, a positive, uplifting sense of moving forward. Started in G, moved up a whole step to A, moved up a minor third from that to C, and then my final is up to E major. So I'm moving up a whole step, a minor third, and then a major third in like sort of my key centers. And I've got this, right, and, I've, and then as I'm moving towards the key of E, I want there to be more activity to bring us into that, right? I want it to be like a really big thing. Big thing, a really huge thing. <laughs> And then this part here is just some nice storytelling music with not much of a melody. And what's nice about that is that it gives you a mood, a feeling, but you can talk over it. So in other words, I can have this figure playing and I can talk over this and there's nothing in the music that's getting in the way of the dialogue. So somebody could be telling more, another part of the story, and really they, that'll let them turn the music up a little louder. Again, change of... Actually, one thing here that's really cool is this, this sound, the way it um, evolves. There's like a little dee-doo-dee, dee-doo-dee. And that combines with the chamber strings. So that's just basically, I think that's E to F sharp minor and then E to G sharp minor. And then at the end here, another kind of a Lydian feel to it. All right, we got, we're in the key of E, right? We've got that F sharp. I mean the A sharp, sorry, excuse me. And again, ascending figures. I want this to be reflective, but yet still uplifting. You know, it's kind of an interesting combination of emotions. I don't want it to be happy, 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 but I do want it to be positive uh, and, and still have some feeling to it. So the way I sort of tie this whole piece together is with uh, all, all the Lydian modes. 
and the way that that sort of goes from each key signature or each key center. I think that's a more accurate term than key signature. All right, so that's a look at this cue. Let's move on to the next one. One of the things I was asked to do with the music from the filmmakers was to have a lot of tracks that are full of energy and that are driving and pulsing that could really just, like I said, drive the film. This is one of the first ones that is completely like that from beginning to end. Even though some of the music that I wrote for this particular project that's sort of like what I would call highlight film music is driving and it has a retro sound to it, sort of 70s sports music with some... 90s twist to it. This is a little bit more contemporary sounding. It starts off with this pulse in the Zebra synth. So I added this in to my synth subgroup. So this is the Zebra 2 by Yuhi. Adds this really cool pulse. And then to that, I start blending in some of the Zimmer percussion. And what I do with here is I use another UHE plugin called the Color Copy, which is sort of like an analog delay. And you can hear if you're listening with headphones on, there's sort of like a tap delay happening where some of the, the delays are going back and forth between the left and right side. And I. I typically would use this in Ascend, but what I wanted to do was, looking ahead to the future, I wanted to print out stems, and I wanted this to be on the stem so that I wouldn't have to try to recreate it later. So I just plugged that insert, the time-based effect, right into the track. And then there's a second track of Zimmer percussion right here as well. And then Damaged Drums comes in. So these are more like just kind of hi-hatty kind of instruments, all three of these. And then I'll come in with a melody shortly on the violins, which I'm using the Abbey Road. And that's, that's again, another Lydian bit. So if we look at this, this is, we're in the key of D, so this is A, F sharp, E, A, G sharp, E, excuse me. <laughs> G sharp, F sharp, D. That's giving me sort of a tie in with the previous cue. I've got that Lydian feel going. And then in the next little bit coming up, another instance of Zebra using bamboo hits. I did an inside track on hybrid music and Right, that's very, very usable in media composition today is to be able to create stuff that uses synthesized elements, acoustic instruments, orchestral instruments, ethnic instruments, just sort of blending it all together to create a, a unique sound. And with that bamboo, there's also this loop here from Stylus. <laughs> few other elements up here from the Zimmer percussion. And then when everything repeats, right, I've got that going. The drums continue on so that it's built up from the first time through this whole bit. And then the melody changes here. I've got a combination of the mandolin swarm, I believe the nylon guitar. And a little ensemble, I add the solo violin to that. So that's kind of cool. Continuing on. So I've got this figure here, which is like very hooky. Like that comes in several times throughout the series and you can really just, it just sort of sticks in your ear and it gives glue to the whole narrative. So I'm really happy I came up with that. So 
so that just sort of oh, that plays in with the zebra and then the, the zebra bamboo so you create that aggregate sound really a lot of power and a nice solid button at the end. Let's move on to our next cue. Continuing on with the high energy stuff, this one here makes really good usage of the Scarby bass, the Rickenbacker bass, and some strings, and some of the high pulsers. There's really not a lot in the stems. There's only those two tracks that do the melodic stuff, and the bass, and the drum kit and loops with some crashes there, or, t or chimes. Let's take a listen to this track. So what's cool about right here, that percussion part is marching band percussion. And I've got that sort of some bio bass figure in there a little bit. It's got a little bit of that Latin funk feel to it. And then this cool that cool figure right there. Nice hit, but then right before that. Yeah, cool. And then we have our melodic figures start here with these high pulses. Now, you can't tell because you haven't heard a lot of this, but that figure right there is based upon the middle section of that first cue that we went over, the sort of the sports highlight music, right? And that'll become a little bit more apparent shortly. So let's pick it up from right here. Right, and you can hear that snare drum roll. That, that's definitely like marching band, band stuff. All right, so that's the chord progression. And then what's nice about something like that is there's no melody yet. There's just that dun, 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 dun in the strings. It's almost like a narration mix, and people can talk over it, and it can still drive what's going on. Let's pick it up from the second half. So I've got this fill, and then this little figure. So again, with some percussion loops that I, I tweaked a little bit to get us a nice Latin feel. Right, that sounds like something out of the 70s or 90s uh, television music. Again, leaving the downbeat off, and then we've got strings doubling that line. So on the repeat, again, not repeating exactly, having that ostinato going in the upper strings. And now you can hear how that high pulsers fits over that chord progression. And then these figures here at the end give them something to cut picture to, and they can also do a quick edit and make that much shorter. They could just sort of do something like this. Right, so they could make it shorter if they wanted to, so it gives them some options. 
And that's that one. That was a quick look at that one, not really detailed, nothing really deep musically, but just a different style that I sort of thought would work really well. All right, let's move on to our next one. This is the 13th cue that I wrote for the project. And at this point, they had started editing together or putting together story ideas. And there was started giving me requests for different types of moods and atmospheres. So what we have here is not a lot of tracks because they wanted something that was ambient. There's basically one, two, three, four, five, six tracks that make up this entire cue. And this is a different feel. You notice my tempo is at 46. So they wanted something that was ethereal and ambient. So let's take a quick listen to this and then we'll break it down. Yeah, we'll listen more. So that's that cue, and there's a lot going on, even though I'm not playing very much here. And that's because I'm using a bunch of patches that Spitfire Audio put out. And this is sort of what I think they've added to the sample lexicon of orchestral instruments that has been really unique and really changed the way that you can create animated parts. I'm using the Kepler strings, and I created this grid here of all these different rhythms. We'll take a listen to that in a second. I'm also using this earth pad, and then I'm using Stratus Piano, which is Oliver Arnold's, and I created this matrix here, and it's just experimentation. And then I'm using String Evo. This is Symphonic String Evolutions, and again, I played around until I got something I liked. I'm processing that with the UAD Moog filter. I've got an audio track where I printed the vocal phrase from the Heaviosity vocal library that I was using. And I've got at the very end some chamber strings just to give me something solid for the last chord. Just something nice and steady on the last chord instead of everything always moving all over the place. So let's break some of these things down. So let's listen to the string Evo right at the beginning. I've just got these long notes. This one is muted. I took that out. All right, and that's two measures. And because the sound is animating, you can do that. All right, and then you add a third note in. 
So you're building sort of like an arch structure. And you can hear how the sound is changing as it unfolds. And of course, there's a lot of work going on with mod wheel expression. So we see here that it's just fi open fifths, right? You start with the C, then we go down to the G, and the C is held straight through. And then you've just got C, G, and C, right? Then we move to a fourth chord, D, G, and C. And same thing here, we've got the suspended chord, a D suspended going to a D, a C suspended going to a C. And because there's so much animation in the patch, this really will sound cool. And then over here, later on, I've got this really interesting cluster chords. So this is D, G, B, and C. So that's like a G triad with the, both the major third and the suspended fourth in it. And it's in uh, inversion with the G and the, the D in the bottom. And that resolves to an F major chord. Right, and this chord here is A, D, A, and B, right? So again, I've got that cluster in there. and that re So that's just sort of like a G chord. Eventually, it'll resolve down over here, right? But the G's not there. We've just got this A that resolves down to the G here. And then we've got over here an E suspended chord. And then... D fourth. So you see how like I'm, I'm adding these really complex harmonic shapes in there, but there's not, like not a lot of notes happening, right? So let's take a listen to the Stratus piano. So if you're listening with headphones on, this piano's in the left and in the right. And then with that is these Kepler high strings. And notice I've got all these polyrhythms. Now for all these Spitfire libraries, they do pretty extensive demos on these if you wanted to see how the, this stuff really works. So you see you get that really cool systems music kind of feel to it, but it's very sensitive and subtle. And then with that is the string Evo. Right, so that earth pad has a little bit of a brass sound to it, and it's basically doubling the soprano line in the string Evo. G to F sharp, and then F to, to E. So that's F sharp. F to E, coming up. And then... Right, so this incredibly subtle piece of music where I'm not writing a lot of notes, but because there's a lot of activity going on with the samples, you can create incredibly complex music with judicious use of notes, you know, the number of notes you're playing, and also by playing around with the different programs, you know, experiment around until you find the kind of rhythm you like, until you find with the Stratus, 
the kind of piano combinations you like. Also with the string evos, play around with the grid there, put those pegs in and just keep playing the chords you want to play until you come up with something that really works. And also don't be afraid to play around with, I'm not sure I do it here. No, I don't, but it has panning on each of these and volumes because some of these can be really loud and you might want to bring tone them down a little bit. There's a lot of programming possibilities available for these things, but you can create incredibly complex music with not a lot of notes. This whole cue took me about an hour and a half to write. And then again, the same thing with these vocal phrases. You know, I just played around with the notes until I found the ones I want. stuff keeps going afterwards it's funny all right so that's a look at cue number 13 and we're going to continue on with the next bit this next cue is some high action driving sports highlight music it's for full orchestra well strings brass some woodwinds percussion and drums and uh, some sound design let's take a listen to it and we'll talk about it on the other side So it just repeats that whole section with a little variation. So we start off with these big strings, and I did a little something different here. We start off with the chamber spiccato. Let's make that a little bit bigger. And then the second time through, I layer in the BBC violins from Spitfire. And the third time through, I layer in BBC violins too. So every time through, I'm adding another section. So that gives a sense of this repetitious ostinato of it building, right? And then now we're adding BBC violin one. Violin two. Okay, and then this big ascending scale with some hits. And then with that, I've got some accents. So I've got it in the bass. I've got it in the low brass. And again, I'm using that Rickenbacker bass. I've got it in the kick drum and in the timpani. So let's just take a listen to some of that. Right. And that's with the strings. You hear the bra low brass doubles that scale, ascending scale. Now, what that those kind of accents are really good for are quick picture cuts. So, you know, I'm building these things into the music that will make it easier for the filmmakers to unfold and edit, right? And these things really do help. 
let's see, is there anything else that's doing those accents? Nope. So let's talk about the percussion because what we have going on after that. In the strings, right, we've got a continuation of variation on this ostinato. But where you get it to relate it to that first bit is with the uh, with with the bass. Let's see, where is that Rick bass? There we go, because it's doing the harmonic progression from E minor up to G, up to C, then to A. Right. So it's that chord progression. It's just a variation, and all these little things. It's not exact repetition, but this variation helps to tie the score together. So that's one of the challenges of draining the music first. Let's just keep the bass going and we'll mute the strings and we'll just solo the drums and the percussion. Oh, there's also this riser here. That's from Native Instruments, Rise and Hit, something I worked out, which really works well. And I put its own reverb right into the track there because I wanted to just make it have a big sound. And I don't use this Oxford reverb often. It's a pretty good reverb. I really like it. So let's take a listen to the drum program. So I've got these damaged drums here. Right? It's that sort of fuzzy, fuzzy thing for the first two. And then a big boom. And then that blends in with the kick drum. So it creates an aggregate. And then we've got our hi-hats driving us. And then I changed the figure around the second time. Notice I had it programmed in here, but I those gray tr notes are muted, so it actually comes in. And then when it comes around this time, I also add this drum line. And that's from the original's drumline, Spitfire. You know, a $30 plugin that came in really handy in this score. And then some accents with the timpani. And then over here, let's see what's on these drums. Big toms on these drums down here. Did did the doom hit that bump? So you have this a cross rhythm. So if I would just do the damaged drums and drums two and the hi hats, we can hear. So you have these come in here, and then these end the lead into the downbeat, right? So it's kind of cool, cool cross rhythms. Did the doom? Did the doom? Did the doom? Big a doom, did the doom, right? Those three note phrases, right? One after the other, and then I pass them around the different drums. So these are just things that you can do to keep up. And then every few measures, I've got this, those snare drums coming in. This is how you program a very large sounding drum beat. Not everything is playing all at once. You're sort of passing things around and creating these longer phrases between the different instrument groups. One other thing that's happening here is I'm using the Bernard Herman winds and I created sort of an aggregate wind thing. Let's listen to that. So I'm using the oboes and I put these all onto a, with the flutes and clarinets and the piccolos and flutes and then all of them together. And they really just, they cut right through the mix. It's really nice. They have this really cool figure here too. Which is doubled with the brass. And then what I added to this that I don't have on anything else 
previous to this is I've added a lot of brass. And basically all I did was I kept my brass group and I just started duplicating one of these tracks, which gives me all my routing, all my grouping, all my color coding and everything. And then I just renamed them, put the plugin in or found the sound that I wanted. So let's take a listen to the brass here. It's a combination of Spitfire and orchestral tools. In the low brass, I've got the Abbey Road low brass here. Great sound. And then Abbey Road trumpets. And then for the melody, I've combined Berlin brass with just a sustained sound. Breath. Right? I always write my breaths in, and I doubled that with the Abbey Road horns. And that melodic figure has not been heard before, but it's just the harmonic thing is so strong uh, and so recognizable that it all just fits in as a variation from that opening. So let's listen to the brass as an aggregate unit. And notice the overlap of the notes here. That's just to get, you know, it's smoother. Power fifths in the bottom. And notice I changed that chord there, right? That, that wasn't in the first time around. It was just the melody. Right, and then the second time around, I have these chords in the trumpets. And then this big ascending scale, just to make it really over the top dramatic. And then the brass works really well too. So this is another thing that I talk about with orchestration all the time is all your food groups need to really work together. Now, in order to make that ostinato fit with the upcoming French horn line, I jump it up an octave, you can see here. Right, so I just got that little suspended thing happening. Right, so just an E minor suspended. And then here, a C2 chord. Right, so you can hear that. Just gives it a little bit of motion, a little bit of something different. Go to the ending and see if there's anything else. Oh yeah, big sports ending. We won. <laughs> that brings us to the end of part one of this video. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. Please comment, please like, please subscribe, please share. All these things help the channel grow. I've been Pete Calandra, and I'll catch you on the next one.